Welcome to day four of our first ever unconference. I hope you have enjoyed the journey. Before I introduce our amazing keynote speaker, I wanna take a moment to show gratitude to all of you for your willingness to show up and join us for this adventure. To our team at Housing California for the incredible time, energy, and tenacity they put into making this unprecedented experience evolve and actually happen. To our board of directors for their unrelenting contributions, support, and leadership. To all of our partners, presenters, consultants for sharing assets and expertise. And to our wonderful sponsors who stuck with us through all the changes from our in-person conference scheduled in April to our unconference experience now. I also wanna take a moment to thank my family and friends who stick by me through all the ups and downs in life. And finally, I'm gonna take a moment to do three more things with you. First, I ask you to pause, sit up tall in your chair, close your eyes if it's comfortable and your body, take a deep breath in and a complete breath out. Reflect on this experience. Notice how you feel, what you've learned, and why this unconference experience mattered in your work and in the world. Monday, we focused on racial justice. Tuesday, on setting a new frame and shaping a, a racial justice narrative to win the hearts and minds of decision makers. Wednesday, we took a deep dive with our partner, California Housing Consortium, and with decision makers and leaders in the policy world pushing for true systems change and structural reforms to meet this moment, right the wrongs of our past and transform our future. Next, connect. Recognize that even though we are physically apart, we are all still connected in this moment and in this movement for housing justice. Today, we're focused on activating shifting and building power for greatest impact through our multi-sector coalitions like our health, healthcare, community development session, and our community organizing networks. Go run. And finally, after this closing keynote, we ask that you take a moment to complete the short evaluation that'll pop up on your screen and then join us at the Housers at Home virtual party. Grab a beverage and join your colleagues in this really cool networking experience to noodle on what we've learned, explore what's now, re-energize for what's next, and then join us for a deeper dive in the learning labs tomorrow. With no further ado, I am both humbled and honored to welcome and introduce the president of Race Ford, Glenn Harris. Glenn has trained hundreds of nonprofits, foundations, and government agencies on race and social justice, for more than 25 years, including many of you that are here with us today. As president of Race Forward, Glenn helps catalyze movement building to achieve racial justice, weaving it into policies, institutions, and cultures. Throughout the conference, we've heard much about how housing justice and racial justice cannot be separated. Indeed, our intersectional movements. At Housing California, we see it, this in our work to end historical oppression. Outside our field, not many know of redlining, restrictive covenants, or, e or other discriminatory practices that have kept communities of color, especially Black Californians, from building wealth through home ownership. Overwhelmingly, as you've heard again and again, these issues affect communities of color first and most. We are proud to partner with organizations led by people of color and show up as co-conspirators in the words of Amanda and Deary, ensuring our efforts are not just about people of color, but led by people of color. Our Residents United Network, our run, is overwhelmingly made up of people of color who have been most impacted by the inequities and injustice who are leading the way. Policymakers must hear from and truly see the people who their votes affect the most. This work challenges us and we deserve to be challenged. As Lao Tzu said, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. We are glad to take it with you. We are honored that Glenn Harris is an experienced guide willing to take us on this journey. Please take it away, Glenn.
Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, I wanted to start out by saying, really, um, I really appreciated your words, Lisa, at the start. Um, I thought it was a beautiful frame for the conversation that we're hoping to have um, in this uh, final keynote. Um, but I also, I have to, I want to thank David. I want to thank Tamara and the whole California housing family for all the work that they put into uh, making this happen. And in this moment, um, as Lisa named, uh, I can't imagine anything more important than naming housing justice. Um, we cannot achieve racial justice without it. And um, I'm really excited that Housing California and the California Housing Partnership are working with partners, and I think many of you, um, on California's Roadmap Home 2030. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that as we get into our conversation, um, but um, how essential it is that we're actually centering homes for all. Um, it is a moment, and I know many of you are feeling it. Um, it's a moment filled with opportunity. It's also a moment that has had so many challenges. And so I just wanted to start out by wishing you and your family um, good health and well being. Um, um, always remembering that's where we have to start. I am hoping today um, to spend a few minutes talking to you about housing, housing justice, racial justice their intersections, why we need to lean into this moment as a moment for systemic change. Um, and then I'm really hoping to open it up and for us to have a little bit of back and forth. So as I'm sharing, I hope you will be thinking about questions that may be coming up for you, things you may be wrestling with in your current work um, that um, might be able to offer some wisdom on. And if I don't have wisdom, one of the beauties of the role that I get to play is that I know many people who do. Um, and so it at least can point you in the right direction. Um, I am going to uh, start out by um, sharing my screen. And what I'm really hoping is um, to be able to get you all um, to jump in with me on uh, a conversation about how do we make change in this moment. Um, and that's actually where I want to start, is really just um, here. Uh, we're at a deep inflection moment in the nation. Um, this is Vincent Harding, um, civil rights activist, um, author, uh, all around genuine, uh, amazing human being. And he asked a really simple question, is America possible? Um, is a just multiracial democratic society possible? and deeply believe that this inflection point that we find ourselves in is begging that question once again for us as a nation. Uh, Vincent Harding said, we are, I am a citizen of a country that does not exist yet. And in that way, um, believe we find ourselves in a moment where we're begging the question of what country do we want to live in? What country do we want to be a part of? Um, and I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, you all know this. Uh, you know, we find ourselves in sort of a trifecta of crises in this moment. Um, COVID-19, uh, economic collapse, police and vigilante murder and attempted murder, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Aubrey, and now Jacob Blake. And all the hundreds of people who could be named and have never been named. Um, truth is, is that one in 1,600 Black Americans have died from COVID-19. A piece that came out just the other day is it's the number three killer of Blacks in the United States, only behind heart disease and cancer. Um, one in six Black people currently are unemployed. And a uh, recent New York Times piece that came out was showing that Black men earn on average 51 cents for the same dollar that a white man earns. Um, and that that is the same gap as 1950. Black people make up only 13% of the US population and yet represent 23% of those shot and killed by police. 
the reality is, is that we find ourselves in 2020 um, in a situation that ironically, and I will talk more about this, isn't that different from 1960. Um, but the other truth is as deep and pervasive as those inequities and injustices are, is that we see action in the streets that we haven't seen um, in a lifetime. Um, representing, I think, um, deep opportunity and in that way, um, really lean into um, what Reverend Barber has named that we find ourselves entering into the third reconstruction. Um, that we find ourselves in this moment, um, once again, begging the question of what it means to reconstruct the country that we all deserve. Um, second reconstruction, civil rights movement, right? First reconstruction in the wake of the Civil War. Each of them led by Black folks and each of them resulting in not only advances in the uh, liberties and freedoms of Black people, but fundamentally intersectional justice. Each of them resulting in actually advances for women. Each of them resulting in advances around issues of both fundamentally class and gender and race. And in this moment, the third reconstruction is begging um, uh, something that's sort of fundamentally different, which is it offers the possibility of not just thinking about changing laws, but fundamentally shifting structures and systems, the very institutions that surround us. And I know that all of you who are committed to justice, it's the only way that we're actually getting to a fundamentally different outcome is if we can reimagine the systems and structures that are around us, that hold us, and that uh, are supposed to be furthering the possibilities for success for all of us. Um, I wanna take a minute and talk a little bit about me. Um, and promise to keep it short, but I think it's important um, just having a sense of who we are as, as people. Um, this is a picture of my family, um, well, some of my family, I should say. Uh, the picture on the left is uh, my mom and dad. The bobblehead child in the middle is my brother. And um, that is 1958, maybe 59. Um, the picture on the right is uh, a picture just shortly before my father passed away about four years ago. And they are why I do this work. Uh, my dad is, uh, grew up in the height of Jim Crow in Tuskegee, Alabama. Um, went to Tuskegee Institute, joined the military like um, many black men of his generation. It was the, really the only way that he saw out. Um, never returned to the South in his lifetime. He met my mom in uh, Great Britain. Um, she's Scottish. And uh, she comes from a long line of um, labor act. And so my household growing up was just endless conversations about race and class. Um, and it is defining for who I am. And it was also defining in this conversation. Um, this is uh, a picture from Ebony Magazine um, in March, 1967. And that little baby is me at a year old. Um, and the article was titled, uh, Minnesota Town Integrates and Survives. Um, uh, I was born actually in Pipestone, Minnesota. Um, and this was just a, a reoccurring reality of our lives. Four years before this in Washington, my parents had been not denied housing in Moses Lake, Washington based on race. And it wasn't until the military base stepped in leadership and said to the business council that we would pull every single officer out of the community in renting housing if you do not desegregate that they actually desegregated and that reality played out for us from the 60s through the 70s it was fundamentally in that way shaping for me and my understanding of these issues and um as you know so many folks have said but my dad said just plainly there's a difference between housing meaning and home and the places that we're living in when we were young, these were not home. This is where our house was. It's where we were able to live. 
but home meant something fundamentally different. And I want to come back to that because I think it is at the core of the change that you need to make. Let me tell you a little bit about Race Forward. So Race Forward, we work to catalyze um, the movement for building racial justice. Um, we are, next year is our 40th anniversary. Um, we've been working on racial equity and racial justice since 1981. Um, we really work in partnership with organizations, sectors, community to build strategy to advance racial justice in policy and institutional change and in culture. This um, really is our theory of change. And I want to spend a moment on it because it's really about what does it mean for us to lean into creating systemic change? Um, that the realities that we see are, are, that are around us um, are deeply systemic. And we really define systems as the interplay of the policy, institutions, and culture. Um, and what we're naming is that if we want to get to systemic justice, if we want to get to a just multiracial democratic society, if we want to answer that question, is America possible? What we're really naming is that we have to grow power for communities of color and advocates for racial justice to be able to transform policy, to be able to transform the institutions in our lives or create new ones, and to transform culture. I'm gonna talk about each of those, but I wanted to pause for a second because part of the reason I was so excited about working with Housing California is that this is much of the frame that has been laid out over the last four days and deeply believe that we are not going to not only achieve the outcomes that we wanna see, but we can't sustain them if we do not figure out in meaningful ways how we have policy power, institutional power, and cultural power. And know that for Housing California, that is at the heart of what folks are building towards. So I wanna take just a second. Um, I'm guessing many of you um, are familiar with um, these concepts and ideas. But I think it's so important that we help um, not only ourselves, but others make these distinctions because they're essential in the moment of what we're actually trying to move forward with change. And so I want to just take a moment to walk through this with you all. So we're really naming that racism is occurring at multiple levels, right? So we have on a micro level, we have internalized and interpersonal racism, individual racism, the way it manifests individually in our lives. Um, on the systems level, macro level, we actually have institutional and structural racism. And so the quickest way to, that I think to hold this is that all of us, um, you know, um, right now and on this Zoom together, um, we all have internalized ideas about race living in the United States, whether we've internalized them or as people of color as internalized racism, or we've internalized them as white folks as internalized ideas about racial superiority. Um, if we act on those ideas with others, then we are in fact discriminating. And that's what we mean by interpersonal racism. The reality is, is that each of us though, work within an organization or institution, and at the institutional level, there is either a set of policy and practice that is moving us towards racial equity or away from it. There is no neutral in this equation. The structures are set up for predetermined outcome. And then finally, within each of our organizations, if we could pan back and take them in as sort of a skyline, like in this image, it is the way in which those institutions interact and how their policy practice, the way in which they hold culture adds up to the outcomes, the devastating outcomes that we see in communities of color. And that's what we mean by structural. I named this because uh, it's maybe interesting, but the piece that's so important is that each of these require different strategies for change. And that there's no way actually to change uh, structural racism by focusing solely on internalized racism. They all require very specific interventions. And we believe that when we say systemic racism, we're naming institutional and structural. And what we're really naming is that that is the greatest point of leverage. That in fact, we are much more likely to move more people by moving systems 
than focusing on individuals. And how do we do that? I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but I wanna name. We deeply believe we have to start with, uh, with uh, our values. What are our shared values? And how, how do they relate to our ideas of equity and justice? And then from there, we have actually got to normalize our conversations about race. We've got to invest the time to make sure we understand our history, the history that Lisa was naming about redlining, about how segregation actually worked in the country, about how, in fact, our entire structures of housing are fundamentally based on the historic racialized nature of who we are as a nation. So that we can actually then think about how we make change. And from there, we need to actually organize ourselves. And we're aiming that within the classic context of organizing. But where are our advocates? How do we build more advocates to actually be able to move to this conversation? And I'm gonna come back to that. And then finally, it's not enough that we're just engaging people and taking action. How do we actually put that into real practice? How do we actually push that through policy? How do we actually bring the tools that are necessary to bring a kind of racial equity analysis and lens to the decision making we're making? And most importantly, how are we measuring impact? Because at the end of the day, these changes that we're naming have to result in material gains for communities of color. They have to be felt by everyday folk on the street. We're naming this because frequently what we see in our work is that we see some pieces of this being done, but not all of it being done. And where we see the most progress in our work across the country is when, in fact, folks are leaning into this as a cycle and a process in which is deepening the work, deepening the outcomes, being clear about the, the, the fundamental definition and needs of systemic uh, change. What is the purpose of this? The purpose is to move us towards where we want to be, which is to be as systematic as the system that we're currently is uh, currently in is, um, to be as intentional, and that to really move us from these ideas of blame, who's the what's the intention, where's the prejudice, what is our core grievance, to what is the cause, what's causing the racial inequities we see, what are the effects. What are the actions? What are the impacts? What does that actually look like in a tangible way? To what are the institutions who are responsible and how do we actually focus on them? Um, to solutions. And, and how do we move from being reactive to proactive to building the world that we all, all want to be in? So I'm going to give a few examples um, uh, for each of these um, uh, to sort of lean in. Um, if we're really wanting to push for the kind of structural and systemic change that we know is necessary, what is this, uh, what could this look like in this moment? Well, I, I just wanted to start with the most obvious, which is um, just even this gathering. Um, the idea of actually building and centering advocates for housing justice and racial justice is what we're really naming about growing power. And wanting to name at the core of that and thinking about the work um, for uh, uh, Housing California, that the core strategies as we think about um, Home 2030 um, is really around organizing, building people power. It's really around policy change, transforming policy. It's fundamentally centered in how do we actually shift the narrative around how we talk about these issues which is really around narrative power. Um, and we have to figure out in this way better strategies of connecting what's necessary for systemic change. That if we want to get the change we want to get to, say it again, we've got to not only talk about policy, we've got to lean in the narrative. We've got to get real about the institutions we're trying to change. And we fundamentally need to come up with policy ideas. And so I'm going to give some uh, a few examples. Um, this one was actually really inspiring for me. Um, thinking about transforming policy, uh, this is North Carolina, um, Asheville, and they actually approved uh, reparations for black residents in, in Asheville. I like this example because actually they were leaning into reparations um, through housing and wealth building um, and really naming that as they think about housing investment, as they think about wealth building investment within the community, 
that they needed to center black folks and in that way acknowledge the history that actually had led us to this moment. Policy at its core is just a fancy word for ideas, right? Um, and the beauty of this, and I'm gonna come back to it, is really connecting the idea of how did we end up with the kind of housing injustice we see with the possibilities of actually addressing our historic um, outcomes so that in that way, we can transform our future. Um, and so I'll come back to this as a potential example for us. Um, I want to talk just for a second about transforming institutions um, and how critical this is. You know, I think sometimes we forget um, that uh, the fight um, uh, that we are in with our opposition is fundamentally about who gets to control the institutions in our lives. Um, even if our opposition is frequently committed to simply destroying those institutions like government. Um, the truth is, though, it is a fight over who gets to own and control them. And in that way, um, one of the things that we work on at Race Forward is uh, we have a national network called the Government Alliance on Race and Equity, um, really trying to work with jurisdictions who are making an explicit commitment to moving racial equity, not only in policy, but as a practice. Um, currently, that network is over 200 members. I'm really proud to say that there's well over 30 members in the state of California. Um, and it's really about, in total, trying to think about what does it mean to transform the sector? What does it mean for government to understand that actually you can't govern without getting to racial justice? Um, and the absolutely critical nature of community nonprofit organizations pushing government for those changes. And I want to name this because I think this is one of the most important things. It's not enough just to ask for the policy outcome. And this is in this moment as we're making policy demands that this piece is so critical. Um, the civil rights period is littered with successes that never got implemented. Um, the truth of the matter is, is that um, uh, I've been um, living in our, our headquarters, Race Forward is in New York, and um, in New York City, um, New York spends, the city of New York by itself spends about $18 billion a year um, on contracts, right, on, on contracts and services. Um, and of that $18 billion, uh three percent of it goes to women and minority owned businesses in a city that's over half people of color and over half women and that represents just to hold that just to be real that represents over nine billion dollars annually being lost by communities of color each year and the crazy part is that's a policy we want it's just not being implemented and so even as we think about what we are demanding, we have to be really clear that we're tying those demand with process changes, with the institution fundamentally changing how it behaves and how it works. Because if we don't, we can end up with wins without implementation. I wanna spend a little bit of time, and I know we spent um, uh, uh, some time already this week really leaning into this question of transforming narrative um, around housing. Um, and um, really think that this is a, a core part of what needs to happen um, if we're really thinking about change. And I know you all know this, but I'm gonna lift it up because I think it's um, central to the moment that we're in. Um, we had the great privilege of working with Community Change and Policy Link um, on a year-long project with Hunters uh, for Housing and Opportunity, really looking at the question of how do you talk about uh, housing change and race. Um, and uh, uh, we worked with Sinlinda Lake and Associates to do a whole series of uh, testing, mess message testing. Um, and we found out a lot. And I want to lean into a couple of things because I think it's, again, this is really important. There is a big difference between messaging and narrative, right? Um, uh, we've seen it in the last couple of months that, in fact, 
messaging around um, what issues of police accountability look like has actually fundamentally shifted. It's not no longer a messaging question. There's a narrative shift that's occurring in real time. And when it happens, it happens fast. Black Lives Matter went from, you know, had almost a 20 point jump in people's support of it um, in a year. Um, and that is because we literally have hit a cultural tipping point. I want to name that because messaging is really about uh, the idea of us starting where people are at. Um, but the idea of narrative change is about not leaving them. There. It's about really thinking about how do we actually expand our fundamental ideas of what we're naming. Um, so let me share just a few things. Um, and I know you all have heard some of this, but I think the highlights are important. And I actually want to really lean into the narrative question, which is, here's the good news. Um, people see the role of government, both federal and local, as, as necessary to in, ensuring affordable housing. So people do actually see the role of gov government as central in this. Um, bad news. Despite widespread anxiety about gentrification, people aren't sure who to blame for the housing crisis. Um, and we haven't done a very good job of making our case. Um, People care deeply about housing, but the intensity for housing justice isn't what it should be. It's not high enough. Although we've been see seeing some movement, for example, or as we think about the housing moratorium, uh, Mom for Housing provides a great example of what happens when we tie some of these conversations to things like direct action and bring a different kind of intensity into the discussion. We deeply believe that at the core of this, we need to really think about what it means to link housing justice to other issues. So as we think about health, economy, jobs, because it's in those other issues that people actually find the intensity that we can actually match up with the deep need for us to actually get clarity about housing justice as a country. I want to take a second. Um, to just emphasize that messages um, are not a means in, to an end um, uh, in and of themselves. They really are an entry point for more transformative change. And so as we think about the messaging, one of the things that we, was really clear is, you know, uh, surprise, surprise, Americans are not um, ready to have deep conversations about race. Um, we found many of the messages that actually named race explicitly didn't resonate as well, to be clear, with folks who were persuadable or opposition as messages that were more race neutral. Um, so the challenge in that is that we want to capture people, in the middle, but we also in this moment cannot step back for a heartbeat from naming the importance of racial justice. So how do we balance those two things? Um, the piece that I did want to take away is that um, uh, we have seen, you know, whether we think about naming sort of Black Lives Matter, when we think about the way in which COVID-19 has been actually really named as um, the ways in which health is racialized in the United States, that this huge opportunity in this moment to connect these ideas. And I would go back to the example in Asheville, North Carolina, of really linking the, the fundamental idea of reparations with the idea of housing justice. Um, so let me just share some of our takeaways. One, people are actually really excited about, um, I shouldn't say excited, or interested in a conversation about housing. Um, eight in 10 people polled uh, gets that housing is a huge challenge for too many of us. Um, the folks also recognize that housing is a basic need. Um, the majority of people see the role of government in intervention as absolutely necessary. Um, but there is a lack of intensity for support for our work. Um, and our job in this moment is to increase that support. So for us, this is a piece I want us to lean into is that even as we are being conscious about our messaging and thinking about reaching persuadables, 
how do we actually lean into the opportunity to really move the narrative? How do we actually really tie housing justice in a deeper way to race, health, and jobs? And that really means that we need to not only focus on the persuadables, but we need to fire up our base. We need to lean into communities of color. We need to lean into our advocates and get real about how we actually move a narrative with some intensity around housing justice and its fundamental intersection with racial justice so that we're not just picking away as usual around the edges, but fundamentally thinking about how we shift the narrative. Um, just naming a couple examples of how that can work. Um, we know that folks have a, 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 a positive reaction to talking about segregation. And what I mean by that is they have a negative reaction to segregation and they have a positive reaction to actually talking about housing justice. Um, there's ways in which we can obviously tie in this moment Black Lives Matter to segregation kills. Um, there's ways in which we think about housing as central to health and wellness, which people respond to overwhelmingly positively, that we can really think about what that means within a racial justice context. And there's ways in, in this moment is that folks are talking about defund the police, that we can actually really think about how we connect that with what does it mean to fund and invest in housing justice. And so really leaning into how do we pull together in this moment some of the narratives, some of the narrative discussions that are in place are in motion and connect them in deeper ways to what it is that we're actually saying about housing. Um, and I just wanna end by again naming, um, um, change happens quickly. Um, and it really is deeply rooted in, have we done our work to lay our base? And are we actually supporting our core base? in being able to push um, a, a deeper truth. Um, the, you know, the truth is, is that May 25th is a, a marker, a turning point for us in, a, in the country um, in which conversations that a month before would have been hard to imagine in public discourse are happening literally daily. Um, just to share for us, um, um, Typically, um, we would get, you know, 20 requests in a month from organizations and institutions looking for support and thinking about how they can bring racial equ equity into real practice. Um, in June, at the height of these conversations, we were averaging 20 requests an hour. This conversation has expanded in a way nationally at every level. Um, and that kind of shift is absolutely possible. And it's one in which we deeply need to be able to center housing justice within that context. Before I jump to that, um, I'm going to wrap up and open this up to some questions. Um, Uh, I've been thinking a lot about this, and I apologize for the, for the pause. Um, I, it's been a hard week, um, and um, this last week lost um, a colleague, comrade in Seattle, um, Rawa Hopti, and um, 42 years old, uh, Eritrean American, powerful sister. Um, organizer activist, um, had started a, a, a business called Hidmo. Uh, and Hidmo is an Eritrean word. Um, it's actually classic um, sort of uh, hut um, in rural Eritrea. Um, but it does mean literally home. Um, and so had started a, a restaurant in the mid 2000s, um, uh, Hidmo which really was a, a rich in food, but really centered around that simple idea that Hidmo is home. And um, pulled together um, hip hop artists, cultural activists, um, community organizers to serve good food, to share culture, um, to center our values. Um, 
And in that way, it was um, a profound um, mover of helping me come to a deeper understanding. And we worked together on issues of gentrification in Seattle, that um, housing is not home. Um, that at its core, home is fundamentally about this idea of belonging. And even as we fight, and we must, to ensure housing um, for all, it is so critical that we never lose sight that the thing we're really looking for is community, is home, is belonging. Um, and that is not just a policy fight. It is most certainly not just a resource fight. It's a fight fundamentally over the values and the culture of who we want to be. Um, the question of uh, radical imagination and um, what does it mean to make America possible? And I want to name, end on um, with a, a quote from Dr. King um, uh, that is from 1968 um, about the moment in 68 that applies so um, presciently to now. This moment, it's exposing the evils that are rooted deeply in the whole structure of our society. It reveals systemic rather than superficial flaws and suggests that radical reconstruction of society itself is the real issue to be faced. It is forcing America to face all its interrelated flaws, racism, poverty, militarism, and materialism. And in this moment, um, we do not have a moment to waste. Um, it's all in now. Um, we have uh, the possibility for us collectively to live into the world that I know we all want to share. And I just want to say thank you, and I want to open it up to uh, questions and discussion. Wow. Thank you for your amazing words and for truly encapsulating our whole week. Um, you know, when you met with our team, we talked about the alignment. Housing California has right a vision for homes, health, and prosperity for all. We shape narrative, shift and build power, and change policy. And I, you embrace that. You embody that. Um, and you, you, you breathe life into it in a way that we haven't yet. So um, thank you for that gift. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Uh, so excited to be working with you and so excited about this journey we're going on together. I um, want to acknowledge one of the, in the chat, one of, our, one of our participants said, please thank Glenn for identifying the difference between housing and home. Mm and then you just said it again with John A. Powell's words about home is belonging. Mm -hmm. And that's where we started the week. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just, I wanna acknowledge uh, just so many things that you bring to this wor work in the world and that you've helped us capture and uh, in, in, in holding that container um, that, we, that we wanna share with you. So thank you for that. So we're going to check out our Q&A box and let's see what we've got. Let's do this. Let's do this. I'm excited. Uh, <laughs> all right, here we go. Glenn, 45 months ago, wow, 45 months ago, in the wake of Trump's election, you asked us if the result was an indication of progress or regression. Has your perspective changed at all, at all in the intervening time? Oh, wow. I, 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 I'm trying to remember even asking that question. Um, I, so what I do think is, um, and I think what I meant at the time, and I still believe, is that it's a sign of both, um, right? That we find ourselves in, um, in a moment in which um, we're ready for change. The, the institutions that are around us, the culture we're in, can no longer live up to what we all want. It's really pretty simple right in my mind in that way. And that folks are looking desperately for some alternatives. And the sad part is I think some folks are looking in all the wrong places. But the possibility in that is that we actually might see the kind of radical change that we need in our lives. Having said that, 
I do want to be, you know, I am um, a radical optimist and a radical pragmatist. And so wanting just the name, um, make no mistake about it, this is the most important election of your lifetime. Um, get out and vote. <laughs> um, there is no question. Um, the question in front of us is pretty clear. We have the possibility of potential authoritarianism or the possibility of an inclusive multiracial democratic society. I hope that's explicitly clear for everybody in this moment. And I hope that folks are out with their friends, their colleagues and their family, um, making sure that folks get what is on the line in this moment. Thank you. Yeah. And get out to vote. Get out to vote. Message. Thank you for making that too. The next question. Since systems are made up of people, mm. don't we need to work on the micro examples, healing racial trauma, actively changing our biases at the same time as macro policy and culture? I deeply believe that's true. Um, you know, I think we have to, there's no question we have to do it all. Um, uh, for us, part of what we're really naming is that um, um, we've all seen it. You can see a whole bunch of people change and not see an institution change at all, <laughs> right? It's, yes. a, it's an odd phenomenon, but we've all seen it, right? Um, and so in that way, just really naming that the thing that sustains change is the institutions and structures in our lives, right? Yes. And so um, leaning into that and getting that right is what creates deeper opportunity for individual change um, and not in any way skipping over how essential that is and the deep interrelationship of the two. Yeah. And I think that's an interesting challenge, right? Because we know that systems and structures are what hold us where we are. And to really reconstruct, we've got to deconstruct. And that is going to have a much broader impact. And so we do need both. And we really greatly appreciate people that are doing that internal work with individuals and interpersonal, and we need to continue to move systems and structures. So, um, well with, said, you, with you, well thank you. All right, here we go. We're still doing well on time. You ready for the next one? I'm ready. All right, let's do this. Thank you so much for your thoughtful, poignant, and vulnerable presentation. Can you speak more to the work in, that the Local and Regional Government Alliance on Race and Equity, GARE, does with local governments, especially around equity and housing. Studies show the majority of people agree that housing is needed, but I think may fail to make the connection between racial justice and housing. And NIMBYism is a strong opposition, oppositional force in local communities. How do you promote this awareness in communities and strengthen support for housing? It's a beautiful question. Um, yeah, so one of the things, you know, and this is, this in some ways comes back to connecting the discussion, Lisa, we were just naming about individuals and, and systems. So GARE, um, it was, you know, it really, the Government Alliance for Race and Equity was really a crazy idea, which is that um, we could do workplace organizing with a race lens and that, that for some reason, we on the left have sort of uh, accepted that the only kind of workplace organizing that is legitimate is around labor, mm -hmm. right? Um, but it turns out that you can organize inside an institution on any set of issues. Um, and so GARE is not fundamentally like, you know, it's not fundamentally focused on elected officials, for example. It is really about how do we build um, thousands of folks committed to racial equity within the institutions that are supposed to be responsible for implementing that reality right and so it's a it's such a pleasure to work with um you know um government employees who um fundamentally understand that is their job that is their role um so i just want to name that um because um, um it, the changes we see repeatedly are you know not coming necessarily from elected officials they're coming from the thousands of everyday folk who are in government trying to make their communities better. 
Um, so to that end, I, you know, coming back and connecting that second question about, so how do we make sure that people understand the role of, of government in sort of supporting and moving housing? I think it's an essential one. And I think some of our strongest um, advocates for community is understanding how frustrated folks who work on issues of housing and government really are, yeah. right? And I know, I mean, I know yeah. you all know this, right? Um, they don't have the resources they need. They can't get the political attention that they need. We could, all the things that everyone in community knows, everybody who's working on housing and government knows. And what we need is deeper partnerships there to be able to leverage mm -hmm. what we all know we collectively want as an outcome. Um, and so much more I could say on that, but I'm gonna stop there. I don't, and I see you not, Lisa. Which what, what, I'm genuinely curious. No, what, you're just you're, you're like stimulating all this thinking for me. I mean, some of our greatest social justice warriors are inside our state and local government working on housing, housing community development. You know, our secretary of our business consumers. Um, and housing agency, et cetera. Like they are such incredible warriors. They've done the scare work with you and they want to make these changes. And I, I was thinking about, you went back to the civil rights movement. We can't just pass policies. We need to change processes, right? So we put That's these right. in place and, and the organizational culture has to change in partnership with community to, to realize it and make it possible. So you're just like, I, I'm just, you are firing me up. So it's just, it's so, <laughs> it just makes so much sense. And so, so much gratitude for your work in this world and the possibilities and acknowledging people inside government, inside systems who really care, who are really committed to this and we need to do this together. So I want to acknowledge, right absolutely. Right I, acknowledge that. I just want to pause for a moment too and um, say, I'm so sorry for your loss and, um, you for sharing that with us and um, you know this is such a moment of trauma for it a lot is. of folks and um, I just want to honor you and um, no, thank you. we're holding you I'm holding you in my heart in my prayers and I'd imagine a lot of things are today so yeah um, I so appreciate that and um, if it, you know to that end if you get a chance um, it's Rawa it's R A H W A Hobby, which is H A B T E, and it's Hidmo, H I D M O, and um, uh, a amazing soul, just genuinely. And if you Google it, you can find a video about her work in Seattle. And I would encourage you all, if you get a chance, um, deeply inspiring work. Well, definitely. Uh, team, can someone put that in the chat so we can share it? And we'll definitely share it after. Thank you for that. I'm definitely going to check that out. All right. We have a few more minutes together. So let's see what we can. Here we go. How do you envision the role of the intersectionality of disability and race in dismantling housing injustice? Uh, disability? Say that again, just so I caught the question. How do you envision the role of the intersectionality of disability yeah. and race in dismantling housing injustice? Oh my goodness. Like it, it, uh, um, I could hang out with you all, all day. Like that is such, it's so on the money. I mean, so, you know, our, so many of our core conceptions of what is just housing has been so completely connected to all the activism and work come out of the, the disability community and addressing sort of, you know, um, even our fundamental conceptions of ideas like uh, targeted universalism, right? The curb cut theory, um, and I, I'm using shorthand here, but many of our ideas about equity are so deeply rooted in the question of ableism. Um, and they're ones that we all can actually hold, I think, and understand. Um, so I named that to say, like, there is no way that we, you know, we focus on race at, uh, at Race Forward. Um, but we very much have a race and approach to our work. And, you know, um, we're not free until we're all, we're all free. And that means we've got to get real about sort of the, the reality of intersectionality. And what does it mean for us to be building housing that works for everyone? And again, I'll come back to, to the, the, the sort of core point that I think has been held over the last four days, which is that it, it's not just a question of does it work? It's a question of do we belong? 
And I think when in that way, if we can actually hold the realities of ableism and racism um, and get real about creating spaces in which people feel like they belong, not only that work for them, but is home for them, um, we will fundamentally be well on our way to building the kind of communities that we want to have. Um, so I, I appreciate the question. I, I think, you know, um, see a deeper sort of partnership and discussions about the, those intersections. And I think we have to get real um, about how, how we actually continue to not only lean into, but expand what those ideas mean in our conceptions of housing and home. Definitely, definitely. One of your slides mentions shared historical facts. What do you do when someone believes history that is skewed or just doesn't believe things like redlining have an impact? Yes. Um, I'm sorry, I should not laugh, but I literally, it, as soon as it was said, it <laughs> may, I, 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 I remember having a not very pleasant conversation um, a you know um, classic in which somebody said that this the Civil War wasn't about slavery, um, and I think you know we are we are in a time just being real um, where you can basically fa find anything you want to confirm your belief system if you just Google it, right? Um, and um, and there is really in a moment where we are deeply anti-intellectual and a rejection of facts. Um, and the truth is, is that as we talk about narrative, people are frequently moved by things other than facts. Yeah. So I will share two things. One is I ref refuse to concede ground on history and facts. Like I, I will fight to the end to be clear about like, yes, the Civil War was about race and slavery. No question about it. The, the, the idea of that is absurd and people need to be challenged on those ideas. Um, and I will say that actually in trying to move folks, which the question was begging, sometimes it's more effective to actually get folks to talk about the emotions of it than the facts of it. So uh, for example, the example I gave, it turned out that what ended up shifting conversation was asking the question, why is that distinction important to you? Why does that generate stress for you? You know what I'm saying? Mm, what, is yes. it, what is it that is motivating you to hold on to, the, to that belief? Um, and I think it's a place that sometimes we forget, right? That, that if we can get to what people are feeling, which is in that case, fear, loss, right, um, we might be able to have a different kind of conversation. Um, last thing I'll say, because I, I think it's so important in this work, um, you're not going to change everybody. Um, I wish it were true, um, but you're not. And um, this work really is, is, it's essential for what we want to build, that we get the folks who are ready to move. Um, and, um, and life is short, y'all, like you gotta be good to you. Um, it's important that we are not just talking to the choir and it's also important that we're not wasting our time on folks who are fundamentally in opposition to where we stand. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you why, because if we actually capture the folks who are in the middle more of those folks are likely to come with us anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's this piece about like, let's find the people who are curious. Let's find the people who are questioning. Let's kind of find the people who are hungry and lean into them. And um, for the folks who seem like they're genuinely stuck, um, let's wish them much love and, and hope that is the majority of us move towards that horizon of justice that they'll join us at some point. I appreciate your words. I struggle with the contact uh, the concept, um, <laughs> but I, I am learning through life to let go. So I um, very much appreciate that and asking different questions and also holding space to listen to other people, which is sometimes hard when we feel very strongly um, yes. 
you know, people are getting different facts fed through their own spheres at this point. So it's, it it's hard. So thank hard. you for your candor. Okay, we're gonna do one more question. Um, okay. and then we're gonna start wrapping and making sure we have time for Elizabeth's closing. So here we go. This is a long one, uh, but from one of my very favorite people. So I'm gonna offer okay. it. Glenn, you mentioned segregation, and I wonder if you could talk more about that. People have a strong reaction about acting on segregation, which is good to note. But I also worry that many people view segregation of the old school Jim Crow type as the main way that racism manifested, rather than realizing why segregation matters and how many harms can happen through structural racism and bias, even in supposedly integrated spaces, like many workplaces or gentrifying neighborhoods, anything to say on how we make the leap for people, which kind of off the conversation I think we were just having. It does, beautifully. <laughs> Um, that is such an important question. Um, so, uh, and I've had, um, I've had many hard conversations around this, which is, um, so, uh, if I understand from what I'm taking from the question, um, it's, uh, uh several fold. One is that segregation, um, is perceived frequently as historic rather than current, right? So, um, uh, and I think it's really important that we understand that, like, we are as segregated today as we were in 1964 as a country, right? So segregation is the reality for the overwhelming majority of us, right? Uh, so there's that piece. But then the other piece is that is being named that I think is essential is imagining that integration somehow is the solution. Um, and the deep shortcoming of that. Um, so the truth of the matter is, is that we want to make sure, for me, that we are creating the reality of an, the possibilities of integration. And we also wanna make sure that when people have chosen the communities they want to live in, whether they are deeply diverse or not, that they have the ability to succeed. And so in that way, um, uh, you know, I think we see this a lot in the gentrification fight, right? That people are naming the way to improve communities is to integrate them. Um, rather than just begging the question, why can't the current community as it exists, whether it be a all Latinx community, all Black community, and all API community, why can't that community simply have the resources it needs to thrive? And I actually believe that's a much wiser choice because I believe that those communities had the resources to thrive, that people would then be in a position to choose where they wanted to live. So I will just name, um, I think that tension is a real one. I understand it in terms of, you know, um, uh, some of the policy decisions that we sometimes are confronted with, but I deeply believe that uh, those are not oppositional ideas. They're actually ideas that um, could bring um, success on both ends. Wow. I wish we could go on and on and on, and I wish we were with our community <laughs> and we were all having this conversation. Let's just say this is the beginning because there it is. It does stimulate so much more thinking. I just I want to take one more moment. Um, my other my the fun fact is I my background is actually public health, and I'm also a yoga teacher. And what's coming to mind for me with you is Namaste names. Oh, thank you. We are all the same, and the light in me honors the light and love in you. And on behalf of California and our community, uh, so much gratitude for you spending your time with us today, uh, but doing the work in this world and continuing um, to hold, hold space so graciously, um, showing up so authentically and having the courage to take the rest of us on the journey as co-conspirators with you. Thank you so much, Lisa. And I just wanna say thank you to your entire team. You all have done an amazing job. And I am so, I just want to say thank you to everybody who's on the Zoom. I've been reading the chat and so deeply appreciative of the comments and thoughts. And um, I know we will be seeing each other all again soon. Wonderful.
All right. Safe, be well. Take care. Thanks, Clint. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. <sighs> well, friends, family, partners, we've almost reached the end of our unconference. And we've had a very, very special experience, hopefully, and we have a very special experience to close with. In a moment, Elizabeth Elliott of the Northern Circle Indian Housing Authority, who helped us open this unconference on Monday, will return to help us close in a healing and heartening way. As many of you know, we are sitting on stolen land, land taken from our American Indian tribes centuries or even decades ago. We read lately about museums returning the archaeological artifacts taken from the tribes. At least that's what they call them. We might call them family heirlooms. While the damage is done so many to, for so many of our indigenous communities, we can remember, respond, and rectify. We must remember and own our past in order to meet the moment and transform the future. Elizabeth is here to guide us on this next stage of our journey. Please take it home with you. Weave it along with Glenn's amazing words and all the learnings from the last few days into your work and into your world. Together, we can create a California with homes, health, and prosperity for all. Thank you. Thank you for taking this journey with Housing California. I want to especially thank Lisa Hershey for creating a safe space for open dialogue about housing justice. Oftentimes when we talk about uncomfortable history, it can awaken anger, insecurities, resentment, and sadness. These emotions may appear through situational triggers in your life. When we finish today, please take the opportunity to heal and go to your nearest waterway to release those negative emotions. For many indigenous communities, water is life. It has the ability to both give life and to take it away. While you are standing there, please place your feet or hands in the water. Imagine that the water is that motherly figure who is able to take all of your pain away. Embrace her and allow her to give you the comfort and peace that you deserve. Let the water renew you. Anytime you are struggling, come back to this place and allow for your healing journey to begin again. Please remember that you are not on this journey alone. And just as the water created a healing opportunity for you, learn to create those spaces for others. For a house isn't truly a home unless there is an opportunity to heal from the inside.